Welcome again to Profiles on Nantucket Community Television, Channel 8. I'm Charlie Walters. Dr. Jen Carberg has been with the Nantucket Conservation Foundation since 2008, and since 2022, she's been the Director of Research and Partnerships at the Foundation. And she's here in the studio today to tell us what that is all about. Jen, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Before we get started, if yep. you could just give a very short description for those two or three people who don't already know <laughs> what the Nantucket Conservation Foundation is. Of course. Um, Nantucket Conservation Foundation, or NCF as we like to shorten it, is a nonprofit land trust here on Nantucket Island. We're only here on Nantucket Island. We just celebrated our 60th anniversary last year, so we were founded in uh, 1963. And the foundation owns property all across the island. We own about 9,000 acres of the island, which is actually about a third of the island, um, is in permanent conservation by the foundation. We own our properties outright, and they're owned for ecological protection to maintain the natural beauty of the island. We have an education department educating about the work that we do and the ecology of the island. And then we actually have an ecological research department, which I'm in. We have full-time science staff uh, on, the, on NCF, which is unusual for a land trust. Most land trusts protect land and do some management. We protect land. We do a lot of management to maintain the rare things that exist on the island. And then we do a lot of research around that to help us understand management, do some restoration work, understand the ecology of the island. And prior to your current position, yeah. what, what did you do with the foundation? Absolutely. Kind of an evolution of what I do now. I started at the foundation in 2008 as our research supervisor. So I came into that ecological research department um, with the idea that I would oversee and help manage all of the different research projects that we do, help implement research, help design what we're doing each year out in the field, take all that data that we collect on all sorts of things from grassland restoration work to wetlands work. We have a wildlife department um, and then understand the data we collect and then help turn that into management that we do in the following year. So let's key in on exactly what you do. Uh, tell Absolutely. us about a, a project you're working on now or have worked on. Sure. Sure, absolutely. I do a lot of things. <laughs> I do a lot of things. Um, my background, my training is in wetland ecology, which means that even though I help oversee all the different kinds of research that we do at the foundation, I myself tend to work uh, in wetland areas, areas that are connected to water, connected to uplands um, and wet areas. They're kind of the space that's in between. And on an island, working in wetlands means that I tend to work in salt marshes and on shorelines. So my biggest projects recently have been understanding salt marsh ecology on the island, trying to get a handle on uh, how healthy our salt marshes are, how they're adapting to climate change, and how we can help them adapt. Um, so a big project that we did uh, just a couple years ago was that we actually installed Massachusetts' first, very first, intertidal oyster reef at one of our salt marsh um, projects. And so intertidal means that it's not on the mainland, but it's just out into the harbor about 10 to 20 feet. So it experiences high and low tides. Sometimes it's not underwater. Sometimes it is underwater. And where is this? This is in Pulpis Harbor. It's the eastern lobe of Pulpis Harbor on the North mm -hmm. Shore. It's called our Madawi Creek property. So Madawi Creek Road is off of Wawinet. So if you're heading up towards yeah. Wawinet, we're just, um, just out there. If somebody wants to see that, mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming they have to walk along Pacama Beach to get there. Is that right? That would be a bit of a long walk. You could go to the um, the community sailing yep. access on Pulpus Harbor, and you could see it. You could kayak over to it if you mm -hmm. wanted to. You'd have to walk on a lot of squishy salt marsh ground if you wanted to get over to see it that way. Mm -hmm. um, the easiest access uh, from land is through Madawi Creek. It's... Um, part of a private homeowner's road, but right. we do uh, educational experiences and tours out there. So because NCF owns a majority portion of the salt marsh out there, we bring the public out to experience and walk and see the salt marsh and see the oyster reef that we have. And why oysters and not something else? It's a really good question. So my goal, the oysters are kind of secondary to my goal. 
my goal was to figure out how I could put some kind of barrier along the salt marsh that would slow down the impact of waves and tides because we were having some issues with losing area of the salt marsh to erosion. Um, the soil was was getting washed out in storms and tides up, you know, because of some, some other impacts that we were having out there. And losing salt marsh area is not great. You want to maintain your salt marshes because they help with all sorts of things from nutrient filtering to providing habitat for most of our fish and shellfish species to protecting our uplands from storm surges. Of course, they're a, one of the main tools we have for protecting the island as we see climate change and sea level rise. So I wanted to figure out how to slow down the impact of tides and waves coming in. And this reef is a structure. It's made out of these concrete blocks that are called oyster, ca oyster castles. They're designed so that oysters will attach to them. Oysters like to attach to something to grow. Um, but they also look like, I like to call them adult Legos. They, they, <laughs> <laughs> they fit together and you can build an interlocking structure that is pretty stable. So we used these oyster castles to build up some rows of barriers that would slow down water as it's coming in to hit a shoreline and kind of take the energy out of that water. Not keep the water from the salt marsh, but slow it down a little. But we didn't just want to put a hard wall up. You know, maybe that provides a little bit of ecosystem habitat for crabs and fish and things. But if we could get oysters to grow on them, oysters help filter water. They help uh, clean up water quality within our harbor. Their food, they become part of that ecological food web. Um, and they actually grow themselves over time. So they help grow as sea level rise grows and would help this uh, this barrier that we've created kind of stay in place longer term. So. We've, we've got the protection piece, and then we have this great ecological benefit of increasing oyster habitat. And what happens to the oysters? So far, nothing. <laughs> it okay. takes about three years for an oyster to mature enough that you could harvest it and eat it. And at that um, point, that will happen? At that point, with the permits that we have from the state, this is considered a research mm -hmm. project. So we have a ton of monitoring <clears throat> and research work we're, we're doing on it. Um, but because it's in public waters, there's one day a year that we have to open it up so that it can be harvested in some way. Uh, and I think the way we're probably going to do this is by having an educational event. We'd like to talk to the schools, or we worked actually worked with the Boys and Girls Club last summer where their students came out. We didn't eat the oysters, but they were sampling and learning about the ecology. We'd like to have some sort of educational event where we bring the public out. We show people how you harvest an oyster, how you open it, have an oyster tasting event, but we're, we're just getting to the point where the oysters will be old enough to do that. Maybe this year, if not this year, then next year. And in case anybody out there <laughs> is worried about this, even though they are cleaning up the water, it's still safe to eat the oyster. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. They're filtering out things like uh, nitrogen and phosphorus as the water passes through the oyster. They're processing that and they filter out cleaner water. Um, they also pull in um, things that they're using to build their shell over time, but it's not like your none of the waters that we would pull oysters from out here on the island are places that you couldn't eat out of. So there is a department at the state that watches water quality and regulates whether shellfish is open or closed to harvesting. And so that's tracked over time and the oysters are tested to make sure they're, they're safe to eat. Pulpus Harbor is one part of the island. Yes. Tell us about another part of the island where you have a project going. Absolutely. Um, some of the other work that we're doing at the Conservation Foundation is that, and this isn't my direct work, I have other ecologists that I work with, we've been tracking populations of the northern long-eared bat, which is very exciting for us. We only learned, oh geez, a couple years ago that the northern long-eared bat wasn't just passing through, that it was actually staying on island and hibernating as well as um, uh, having pups here, having maternity roosts on island. So we had a researcher that came out uh, through another organization. She wanted to see what bats were here. And through her work, we learned that the northern long-eared bat was actually here on island, which is not often that you learn on an island this size that you have a species that's here more than you thought it, it was. But, um, you know, bats are out at night and we often aren't. So we learned that and we've been tracking their habitat, figuring out where they are on island, what they're using. Um, they have their maternity roosts in pitch pine trees. 
which are our predominant native uh, tree species out here. And so you'll find them in pitch pine stands across the island. Mostly we've seen our biggest populations kind of on the western side of the island, a uh, ram pasture, gardener farm, those areas. Um, but we've seen uh, some out in Squam as well. Um, and so they're in those pitch pines uh, in the late spring and through the summer raising their young. Um, and then uh, we're looking for the places that they're hibernating, uh, their hibernacula over the winter, which often seems to be actually in um, uh, unfinished basements and crawl spaces. We don't mm. have caves on island, so it was often thought we, that we didn't have bats staying uh, long term. Um, but we've actually built uh, a hibernacula to see if they'll use it. We've built them a space. Um, in some abandoned uh, old um, uh, foundations and foundation areas. And we've built mm -hmm. in kind of some enclosed areas that they would use to, or to see if the bats will use it as hibernacula to see if we can provide them places to stay over the winter. So that's one of our ongoing research projects that we are working on on the island. How big are these bats? Oh, they're not that big. Not this one. There are some big bats out there, um, you know, but, but our bit and you know, I'm not the wildlife ecologist, so I'm not going to give you the exact numbers. Um, but they're, they're pretty small bats. Uh, we will trap them in the summer. We, uh, Danielle, who is our wildlife ecologist, does mist netting for them so that we can measure them, see how healthy they are. We're looking for signs of health in the bats. Uh, we've tried to put some trackers on some of them, microscopic, really? microscopic little trackers that you attach to the back of the bat. They go off, and then we use um, a transceiver to relocate the signal that that, um, that that is sending off from the bat and track where it goes. And that's where we found some of the um, places that they have their maternity roosts and pitch pine trees, so we can help identify those habitats and areas around the island that they're using. Now, pitch pines. Has there been, been a problem with pitch pines? <laughs> and how does that impact oh. the, the, the bat research? It's funny you should ask that. We have had some significant problems with pitch pine populations on island, particularly this year. So one of the things that I do a lot of my work on is understanding climate change and how climate change is going to impact the islands. Usually I'm looking at the shorelines, looking at sea level rise and erosion and those things that you think about on an island when you think about climate change. One of the things we're also seeing, though, is changes in ranges of invasive species, particularly insects, because they can travel. And there is an insect that has been traveling up. It's called the southern pine beetle. As you can imagine, it's a more southern species based on its name. Um, but with our more mild winters that have been occurring without our hard freezes, we've been seeing these in insect populations moving north. We've actually been tracking them for quite a few years, we've been putting out traps to see if we're getting these uh, insects coming to the island. And this year, we had enough of the southern pine beetle come to the island that we had what's called an infestation. So they like our pitch pine trees. They come to our trees. They attract all of the other insects. They put out a call, essentially, to the other southern pine beetles in an area. And then you can get thousands of insects in these trees, and they're breeding in the trees. and they end up killing the tree, um, and then they move on to the next tree and the next tree. And the best way that we have to combat this so far um, is finding their first infestations, finding where there's one or two trees that are starting to die, and taking those trees down, cutting them. Cutting the trees stops the, the signal that the insects are sending out, so they're not sending it out still, and then you cut down trees kind of in a perimeter around that one that you took down and then you hopefully stop the spread and the population of the insects go back down for, for a little bit. Um, we had that happen this year out at Westgate and Ram Pasture, which is one of our primary places that we have northern long-eared bats. Uh, and it was a pretty big infestation and we had to cut a lot of the forest that's out there. We're learning a lot about forest management right now, which is something that the island itself hasn't done a lot of. We've been working with the land bank and with Mass Audubon to understand how we should manage our forests to be healthy and how we can respond to this. Um, what happened this year out at Westgate was a suppression activity, we call it. So there was an actual outbreak of beetles. So we had to do a lot of management in order to stop that. 
we're hoping that going forward, we can do more forest health management. The healthier our forests are, the more they can be resilient to having the beetles in them, the more likely we are to find, you know, one or two trees that are impacted so we can take those, those down. Um, losing the pitch pine trees will be a big impact for habitat for the northern long-eared bat. So that's one of the reasons that we want to do a lot of forest health management so we can maintain our forest for these. The northern long-eared bat is an endangered species, so we want to help protect its habitat the best that we can. So we're, we're learning right now how we're going to manage our forest, how we're going to respond to this invasive species that's coming in. Now, Westgate is what used to be called Government Gate. Government you Gate. You have to drive on a dirt road for a mile or so. Yes. But uh, the path, the main path away from that parking lot mm -hmm. at Westgate, um, you were saying before the show that most of the area cut down, you can't really see from the path. You cut a lot down, but it's not blatantly obvious unless you know which path to go on. As you go down that main path, it is that forest area that's right there to your left as you're yes. walking out to the ocean. Um, but there are still pitch pine trees that are in there, and there's still a, we left, you know, the shrub buffer that exists along that path. So it might not be immediately obvious as you start to walk how much management has happened in there, mm -hmm. how much the forest has shifted and changed. If you're someone that's used to going, you know, looking for your particular trees or looking off the path deeper into the forest, you might see some change there. We're... It was a, a rough management year for us out there. We were sad to see a loss of a lot of that forest, but we're also really, really interested in seeing how the forest responds to being managed like that, to seeing mm -hmm. what comes back. So as we move into this year and following years, that's going to be a big focus of a lot of the research work that we're doing is understanding forest regeneration, how the pitch pines are regenerating. You know, can we outplant, you know, can we grow an outplant? Pitch pines, uh, we're going to be learning a lot about we, how we help that area recover um, and other areas on the island where we, where we might have to manage the forest a little bit more intensely. I'd like to hear more about some of the changes you've seen in either wildlife or plant life as a result of our warmer winters. It's a, good, it's a really good question. We are seeing changes um, in timing of a lot of things. So... Really what we're seeing on Nantucket with changes in our climate is that we're getting warmer springs and we're getting warmer falls. So we're kind of extending that. That shoulder season has definitely expanded. And then one of the things that I see a lot is we're getting changes in not necessarily the amount of precipitation, but when it comes. So we're definitely getting changes in drier summers, kind of hotter, drier summers where we're getting more moisture this time of year, right now and into spring and then into the fall. So we're starting to see some of our summers uh, where our ponds are drier than we would expect them to be. The temperatures are warming. Um, one of the things that we've seen a lot in recent years is harmful algae blooms popping up in our yes. freshwater ponds and that's climate change driven. It seems to be that our waters are getting warmer, warmer. We're drier until we have one flash intense rainfall event. Say in July, we get a, an intense storm. That'll wash a lot of nutrients into these warmer waters that we have, and then we end up getting these al algae blooms that are, are triggered um, by that flush, by that change in, in precipitation and the higher temperatures. And we're seeing that a lot in more recent years, and that's kind of the weather pattern we've had really for the last five years, I'd say. Um, Do you get the algae in brackish ponds? We don't really, no. Mm -hmm. um, not as much in brackish ponds. There are other algae that will be in salt water that's more saltwater focused. We haven't had as much of an issue with that here as you know we've seen in places like Florida and other places that have had really intense um, algae blooms in their very, very warm waters. Here, our biggest issue has been in our freshwater ponds. And what are some of the freshwater ponds? What are some of the brackish ones? So a majority of our ponds that you encounter inland on the island, most of them are fresh water, naturally. So that's, you know, looking at Hummock Pond is, is fresh, Maya Comet is fresh, uh, Gibbs Pond, um, 
the ponds that are brackish are the ones that we actually cut open, that we open up to the ocean. It's so, the Sacagawea, for example. It's the Sacagawea we open. And that one stays brackish most of the year. It's a shallower pond. It gets a lot of uh, saltwater influx, um, and it probably gets saltwater moving um, kind of horizontally through the soil as well when you have that close connection oh. to the ocean. Uh, Hummock Pond is mostly fresh. The majority of it is fresh. It gets salt, which is what makes it brackish, is having that salt in it. It gets a little bit brackish when we because we open that one up twice a year. Um, but it doesn't stay brackish as long as Sacagawea does. So over time, mm. that fresh water um, mixes and the salt um, um, dissipates and get, goes out of the system. Now, you were mentioning a moment ago that uh, the, the ponds are lower and so on. Lack of precipitation. What about humidity? There seems to be no lack of humidity down There's, here in the summertime. <laughs> there is no lack of humidity so the, here in the summertime. We so the, are, are very humid in our in our air systems. Um, one of the things that you might not know, this is just one of those um, tidbits or facts that I have, is that one of the reasons we have a large tick population is due to humidity. They love humid weather. Hmm. It helps ticks breed. It increases our tick population. Um, so the more humid it is in areas, sometimes the more ticks you have. And that's another shift with climate change as well as you're getting more humidity in the air and the warmer temperatures, you can get spikes in your tick populations. Now, do you work, do you personally work exclusively on conservation foundation land? Yes, yes. All of the work that we do, our research and management work, is on conservation land. We have partnerships with some of the other organizations on island where we might design research projects together and help each other uh, with our work. Um, but our work is on our properties. I'm glad you mentioned partnerships because that's, that's <laughs> part of your title. It uh, is. Talk some more about what you do in, in that regard and with whom you work. It is, absolutely. Um, so my current title is Director of Research and Partnerships. So I'm overseeing all of our research. And then I'm building research partnerships and partnerships within the community as well. So um, working at a nonprofit, I think it's really important to make sure you make connections to other organizations and groups that are doing things similar to you, parallel to you. We're a small community on island. Nantucket is a, is a small community. And we don't... We want to build these interactive partnerships that kind of raise up the work that everyone is doing. The more we work together, the bigger benefit we can have for the community. Uh, and so we make connections with different conservation groups on island. I partner a lot with uh, Linda Loring. Sarah, Dr. Sarah Boyce and I have taught some coastal ecology classes uh, and do a lot of work around climate change. Um, we are currently re partnering with the Nantucket Land Bank when it comes to the Southern Pine Beetle work that we're doing in the forest health management. Uh, we've partnered with them because they're one of the other big landowners on island and are seeing similar issues with Southern Pine Beetle and wanting to manage their forests. Um, we are partners in, on island, a group that's called the Nantucket Biodiversity Initiative, mm -hmm. which is actually a partnership of all of the different conservation groups and conservation-minded um, businesses, some of the businesses on island, that are working together to help bring more resources to the island to study and understand what's unique about the island. So it's, it's reaching out to on island to make all those connections. And then we're also really working to build our connection with other researchers in Massachusetts and New England and build partnerships that bring graduate students and other researchers to the island that are maybe studying similar issues somewhere else and just haven't come to Nantucket for whatever reason. We're kind of far out there, so sometimes it takes a little <laughs> bit of effort to encourage people to, to come over and, and, and work with us. And so we've been building those kinds of partnerships to just help increase the knowledge that we have to do our work uh, and the knowledge that we can contribute out to the wider, wider ecological community also. Now, you said the foundation has eight or 9,000 acres. Yeah, about 9,000. Uh, a huge chunk of Nantucket, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, should I assume that at one time or another you are spending time on all 9,000 acres doing something? Oh, that's a really good question. There are probably parts of our properties that I have mm -hmm. not visited. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, that's 9,000 acres is a lot. But we have work going in each of the different 
ecological habitats that are on islands. So we have work out on Kotu and our barrier beach. We have work in our dune systems on the south shore, out at Eel Point. I'm in the salt marshes a lot. That's where I spend a majority of my time is, is tramping out through salt marshes. But we have people out, um, you know, in Head of the Plains, which is our big sand plain grassland out in Mattaket. We have people in Squam Swamp, Squam Forest, doing forest work. So we try, we, we have a lot in a lot of the different areas on the island. But I bet you that there are places I haven't been to. Well, 9,000 is an awful <laughs> lot to, to, to see every part of. <laughs> Well, let me ask you about the cranberry bogs. Oh, yeah, sure. What's going on out there and why? Absolutely. Well, we have two cranberry bogs. So there's two different things happening at each one. Milestone cranberry <laughs> bog is the bog that we still have cranberries in production on and are going to maintain cranberry production on into the future. Um, that's the one that's off of Milestone Road and connects to Gibbs Pond. Looking to the left or looking north yes. from the Scotsa Road. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and then the windswept cranberry bog is up off of Pulpus Road. And so windswept cranberry bog, uh, we retired cranberry production out there um, about six, seven years ago. Um, we found that managing the two cranberry bogs and we were managing them organically, we just didn't have the staff or resources to manage both of them um, and get effective harvest off of them. It's also an industry in Massachusetts that's been impacted by climate change. So as we've had our changing climates, our warmer, milder winters, it's been harder to manage cranberry bogs. And this has been happening all across Massachusetts. So we've seen this shift in change where um, we are becoming a habitat that it's harder to really grow cranberries in. There are um, some cranberry vines and varieties that are better adapted to climate change. So we're looking into that for milestone cranberry bog. But this windswept cranberry bog off of Pulpus Harbor, we retired it um, from production and focused all of our energy on Milestone. And then we said, well, now what are we, what are we gonna do out here? We have an area that most likely used to be a wetland because most places that had cranberry bogs used to be wetlands. Cranberries like to have their feet wet. That's where they wanna be. But we've changed it and manipulated it and we've farmed it for so long. We've built dikes and ditches and we've really separated up this area that used to be a natural functioning wetland. So we partnered with the Massachusetts Department of Ecological Restoration, which has a whole cranberry program. And what they're doing in that program is helping landowners figure out how to turn your cranberry bog back into a functioning wetland, back into the kind of wetland that used to be out there. So we've been working with them and doing a lot of research out there for about four years now. Um, we were working with them. We have a partnership with a consultant called Fuss and O'Neill who helped us collect data and design a research or a restoration project that would turn all of that cranberry bog back into natural functioning wetlands. And that's what we started almost January 1st to this year. We broke ground out there and we are doing construction work with heavy machinery that will turn it actually back into a wetland over time. Uh, how much time and what will it look like when Abs the job is done? Absolutely. So we're doing it in phases, um, most likely two years, potentially three years. We'll see how long. So for this phase one, we're working in two parts of the bogs and we'll be done with the work with this construction restoration work uh, mid-March this year. And then we'll start the other sections um, when it comes around to about November next year. So we don't want to work during the um, bird nesting season. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have turtles that use the bog, so we don't want to work when the turtles are moving. So we're taking a break during the growing season in summer. And the work that's happening, just to kind of put it in perspective, I, I say construction work because it, it, it feels like it. It's a lot of earth movement, a lot of restructuring of, of the soil that's out there. But eventually, we'll get these nice, broad, open, grassy wetlands that have some pools in them. Um, not really any streams, because we don't have streams on Nantucket. That's, no, not no. Our, that's not our structure. It is if you go to some of these bog restorations off-island. Um, but here, a lot of it might look like 
um, really what the exit of the cram of windswept cranberry bog right now is when you're driving out Pulpus Road, just before you get to the Wawinet Road, mm -hmm. you look off to your right and there's this open cattail grassy marshland. That's what a lot of it will be out there. Um, we're using this heavy machinery to go in and scoop the soil and turn it over because we're trying to get back down to the peat or the organic wetland soil that is used to create or be the base of the wetlands that are down there. When you do cranberry bog um, agriculture, one of the ways that they help the vines grow fast is to actually put sand across the bogs when it freezes, when it used to freeze, the bogs would <laughs> flood. You'd get a nice ice layer and then you'd go out and you'd spread sand across it. The ice would melt and the sand would land on the cranberry vines and then they'd have this big growth spurt to get up and grow through that sand. And all that gets compacted over time. So even though all of the water of that wetland, you know, even though all the groundwater is there and you can flood the bog, what happens if you just walk away from a cranberry bog is that it usually turns into an upland because the water can't come up through all that compacted sand layers. It just doesn't come up on its own very well. So you have to scoop it up and break it up. And so you kind of scoop and flip and turn and fill in the ditches so the water doesn't just go through a ditch because water takes the easiest path. So as we kind of restructure that soil, it'll allow the water to move up into all of the areas that used to be bog and help turn that back into a wetland on its when, own. When you say it, it can turn into an upland, what, what does that mean to you? What does it look like? Yep, so it's usually dry. It's the soils will stay dry, and then actually we'd probably end up getting scrub oak and pitch pine moving in over time. We have a bit of scrub oak already. <laughs> quite a bit of scrub oak on <laughs> island. And scrub oak is great and has all sorts of benefits, but in an area that used to be a wetland, we want to try and get that wetland vegetation back, get that habitat back have some open water areas that birds will want to use, that the turtles are going to want to use um, in, the, in the summertime. So that's what we're going for. We're going to research it as we do it. That's kind of why we're doing it in phases. So we're doing this first phase. We're going to monitor what happens. What did we do right? What's working this year? Then we'll move into the next stage out, that's out there. And I should say, because this, this I think is really important um, to people that use that property. A lot of people use that property. A lot of people love windswept bogs, there will still be public access through that area. Mm -hmm. um, if an area has been turned into a wetland that's not a dike road any longer, we're going to have boardwalks. So a lot of the area will still be as accessible as it is now. We just kind of have to get through mm -hmm. the construction process. Well, that's good to know. I mean, the yeah. land will still be there. It will still be accessible yeah. one way or another. Yeah. And it will be beautiful. Yes, it will be. <laughs> You've mentioned peat a few times. I have. Uh, I think there's probably more peat here than people know about. Oh, yeah. how, how much peat? Oh, geez. I mean, is it the whole island, or or pretty much the whole island that has peat underneath the, the the ground level? Good question. Not the whole island. Primarily, our peat deposits are the areas that have <clears throat> wetlands right now, unless we've put a lot of fill over them, like in our downtown area. Our downtown, most of our downtown used to be a salt marsh, and mm -hmm. uh, we brought in sand and other things to fill in on top of it. So if you dig down, if you're ever doing a foundation in town, you're going to hit layers of peat that are down there from where the old salt marsh used to be. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, the, the area, Federal Street going north, mm -hmm. um, that used to look pretty much the same way the creeks do today. Is yeah. that right? Yep. It's kind of hard to believe, but it's, that's what is true. It is true, that whole area. And then if you might not realize it until you know and then take a look at the landscape, but from Lily Pond all the way down past American Seasons, back behind the Nantucket Hotel, mm -hmm. and then all the way out to Brant Point, that all used to be connected wetland, some salt marsh, some marshland, um, and uh, we've just kind of, we've built over parts of it, we've built around parts of it, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of our land near our harbor has definitely been changed from what it originally was. And now it's headed <gasps> sort of back to what it used to be, but that's another something. That is another. So the water <laughs> is coming back. <laughs> we have to decide where we're going to put it as it comes back as sea levels are rising. And that's why we're getting more flooding in our mm -hmm. downtown, because our downtown is at or below sea level in places. Yes. Mm -hmm. The foundation has so much land that I'd love to ask you about, but we don't have 10 hours <laughs> in which to do it. 
But let me uh, ask you about Co2. Of course. And that's, that's one of the, the greatest places yeah. on the island, and yeah. it's a place that a lot of people never get to because it's a long walk and not everybody mm. has a Jeep. Nope. But, but talk about some of the things that go on out there because almost 100% of Co2 is Conservation Foundation land. We Yes, the, the Co2 spit that comes out and creates the harbor, about two-thirds of it is, is uh, Nantucket Conservation Foundation land. When you're just driving up along the, uh, along the haulover, mm. a majority of that is ours. And then the other ownership is with, with the trustees of the reservation. So we have yes. a pretty strong partnership with them about access out and across the refuge. And now we're building partnerships around understanding how resilient CO2 and the haulover will be to climate change uh, in the future and erosion and, and possible breaches from sea level rise. So that's what a lot of our focus out there is right now. And also we have amazing shorebird populations out there. <laughs> well, that's right. we'll talk about that. What, mm -hmm. what shorebirds do we see out there that we might not know are there unless we're actually out there? Right. I mean, you might know. They're the ones that are uh, the shorebirds that we see around the island. But we have uh, oyster catchers, American oyster catchers. Those Big orange With beaks. Big orange beaks. The most charismatic. And again, I'm a I'm a plant person. I'm not a, a wildlife uh, ecologist, but that was one of the first birds that I could recognize when yeah. I moved oh, out yeah. here. Um, they're very distinctive um, and beautiful, beautiful birds that um, you'll usually see in, in pairs moving around the around the refuge in the summertime. Uh, and then we also have uh, piping plovers that are out there. We have ground nesting cormorants that are out there, which is pretty hmm. unique. Usually they don't nest on beaches, but our our dune system out on Kotu is a place that the cormorants nest. The cormorants are the birds that often yes. spread their wings to yes. do I don't know what, but that's... they're drying them they're drying themselves out. They tend to they are um, they hold water up on top of their feathers so they kind of have this oily substance so that the water doesn't sink into their skin and um, my kids call them the stinky birds because they, <laughs> if you take a boat out out the jetties and you pass the the channel marker out at the end they like to sit out they like to sit out there and it, they can, they're birds they can be a little smelly <laughs> <laughs> well it's an unusual sight does anybody else do that on a regular basis Nothing I'm aware of. Yeah, not that not that I'd see like that. They're yeah. they're very distinctive. So they'll sit and when they perch, they usually yeah are raising their wings and mm -hmm. and drying themselves out. Yeah, I'm not going to say where I've seen this, although a lot of people will know. But I have seen cactus on Co2. Yes, you have on Conservation Foundation land. Absolutely. And it survives saltwater flooding, which I find astounding. A little bit, a little bit of saltwater flooding. I mean, I, I think yeah. of cactus like we all do, of you know Arizona or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And yet, mm -hmm. number one, I, I assume it was planted here. No. 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 It's... Now talk some more about that. <laughs> I, I, I had never heard that. That's it fascinating. Is, it is native to here. It is the prickly pear cactus. Yes. Very close to the ground. Yep, Opuntia humifusa. Um, and we are the northernmost um, location for it on the eastern uh, really? seaboard over here. You can also find it in the Great Lakes. It, it grows oh, okay. in sand dunes around the Great Lakes as well. <clears throat> so it grows in sandy areas. So it's still these really nutrient-poor soils, um, and that's partly why you you have the cactus growing there. Um, it's it's not a wetland area. It doesn't have a lot of water to it. It's pretty dry. Um, and they grow in areas that don't have to be hot like a desert, which is what you often think of mm -hmm. um, with cactus. But we're part of its its native range out here, and the best place for it is out on Kotu because we've got the whole thing as a barrier beach. So it's mm -hmm. all this a spit of sand with almost no water out there at all, uh, and it's nice and dry, and the cactus are kind of they're, if you know when to look, they're out there kind of in the open sandy areas. You often will find them tucked up right on the edge of where some slightly taller shrubs are growing. Mm -hmm. They like to circle where the salt marshes are uh, out there. They're just at that highest, highest area where maybe they get water once a year kind of thing. Um, but we have cactus. Well, this explains why I've also seen it in town, and there's no way I'm going to say on television where I've seen it in town because <laughs> I won't be there very long. You can buy it and plant <laughs> it. You know, you could go uh -huh. into a, 
a greenhouse and buy it and plant it out. Um, and it does it does pretty well out here as long as you're not giving it too much water. Mm -hmm. But now you mentioned the Great Lakes, which gives me a good lead in to ask <laughs> to ask me where you grew up, where you studied, and how you ended up on Nantucket. Oh sure, my roundabout story of <laughs> I'm actually originally <laughs> from Dallas, Texas. That's where I was Even born. Even more roundabout. Even more roundabout. I'm initially a southern girl, which is probably why I like summer the best. Um, and my my mom moved us up to outside of Detroit in Michigan when I was in third, fourth grade. Uh, and I had to get rid of my accent. I didn't think I had an accent, but the kids at school let me know pretty quickly that I did have an <laughs> accent. <laughs> Something about the way I said the word car. I don't know. Um, so I, I consider myself, you know, really a, a Michigander from, from the Midwest, from the state of Michigan, surrounded by water that looks like an ocean, but is not salty mm -hmm. and there's no sharks. Um, and no tides either, I guess. No tides. We get seiches, seiches where the, um, you can get big wind and storm events that actually mm -hmm. push and move the water, yeah. um, but not tides. It's, it's not really tidally influenced. Um, so yeah, I grew up out outside of Detroit, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, not the prettiest part of Michigan. There are other, other prettier parts. And uh, I went to my undergrad at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. I went to school with Tom Brady, which always works really well out here. People like that. Well, I have to ask you, knowledge. did you know Tom Brady? I, I didn't know Tom Brady, but I met Tom Brady a couple of times okay. in college. Okay, well. <laughs> yep, we were there at the same time. <laughs> you can dine out a lot on that story. Yep, you can, you can. It works, <laughs> it gives me a lot of street cred in New England. <laughs> um, so yeah, I did my undergrad at the University of Michigan. It was a great place to be. And how did you end up on Nantucket? Oh, um, I, after I did my undergrad, lived in Chicago, worked for a while, and then I did my graduate degrees up in northern, northern Michigan in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, huh. farther north than most of populated Canada. There was a lot of snow, and it was very cold. <laughs> and not a lot of people. Pretty, no. Pretty isolated. No, area. pretty, pretty, pretty isolated. Actually, when I was looking to move here, uh, or when I was looking and interviewing for the job that I came to Nantucket for, one of the conversations that I had was that Nantucket is a pretty isolated place to live. Sometimes it's hard to leave here in the winter. There aren't a lot of people here. And I said, yeah, let me tell you about where you, I live right now. Been there. <laughs> Sometimes you can't drive to the mall in the next town over, because that's where you had to go was the next town over, for a week because there's so much snow on the ground and the roads are impassable. So it's like I... I can handle this. I'm, Nantucket is farther south than where I was, so I was moving oh. to a more hospitable climate when I came down here. Nantucket is Manhattan compared to the UP <laughs> exactly, of Michigan. Exactly, exactly. It's a beautiful, spectacularly beautiful place to live, yeah. especially if you like to be outside and you like to do things outside. Um, but I finished up my uh, my master's and my my doctorate degree up there, and I was looking for a job. You know, you finish school, you want to look for a job. And I found a posting for an organization called the Nantucket Conservation Foundation on Nantucket. And I said, oh, Nantucket, that's that's out in New England somewhere, somewhere over. My grandparents are from Rhode Island. Um, and then I looked it up on a map. This is pre-Google, but I looked it up on a map and said, oh, it's an island. <laughs> it's an island that's you know, pretty far, pretty far from the mainland, but you can't see it from the mainland. <laughs> you can't see it from the mainland. No, not at all. Uh, and I made the trek here. It worked. I came out. I visited. I I liked the the job. I liked the island. I liked the organization. And I came out. And we were going to come out. My husband and I were going to come out for you know a couple years and then see what's next. And. We're still here 16 years later, which is kind of what happens on Nantucket. That's a familiar <laughs> story. A very... I, I came for two weeks three years ago, that yep. sort of thing. And yeah. I'm still here. You get sand in your toes. That's what they say. <laughs> and you can't go anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we go, we're taping this in February of 2024. Yes. Um, what can we look forward to uh, from the foundation, especially regarding your position there? Uh, in the months to come. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're really looking forward to the research work that we're doing out at Windswept and helping bring people out and seeing the results of the work that we've done. So we we have a, a full suite of what we call our excursion calendar that we put together for the next couple months and into the summer of all of the ways that people can come out and experience the work that we're doing. So I would say keep an eye out for that coming. 
Um, we have a couple talks and things planned for the next couple months. We're doing, uh, I, one of the partnerships that I've built is with Remain Nantucket. We do a community book club focused around the environment. Every couple months or so, it, it rotates and, and we find some other island partners to bring in. The one that we're doing coming up is in mid-February, and we're actually partnering with the Youth Climate Committee, uh, which Mass Audubon runs with the high school uh, and the Athenaeum. And the students of the Youth Climate Committee have picked out a book um, related to climate that we're going to discuss together as a community. So if anyone wants to come out for that, you can go to the Athenaeum and pick up a free book um, and read it and come to our community discussion. So we have that coming up and then we have um, some others that uh, will happen in the next few months or so. So pay attention to that. That I think will be, that's a really nice community event that we have. Well, having been here since before the foundation existed actually, mm -hmm. I have walked, bicycled, driven, in a couple of cases, crawled through the scrub oak. <laughs> On Conservation Foundation yes. land, and uh, thank God you guys are here. Thank you. You've done yeah. a great job, and uh, yeah. it's nice to hear about it from one of the people who's out there actually doing that work. So mm -hmm. thanks for coming on, Jen. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. <laughs> for Nantucket Community Television, Channel 8, I'm Charlie Walters on Profiles. Thanks for watching. Please tune in again. <laughs>